Uh, sir, we are going live, sir. We are live yeah. now with all your permission. I'm starting this session, sir. Yeah, sure. Good evening, everyone present here. I am Faraz from IJCP Group. I welcome all the participant doctors on today's session. Let's welcome today's speaker with great honor, Dr. Karan M. Anand Parasar. Sir has done DMRD, DNB, FRCR, PDCC, Hepatobiliary Interventional Radiology, and EDIR, PRACCO, ESOR Clinical Fellow 2020 Germany, and consultant at Indovascular Clinic Mumbai. Today, sir is going to discuss on a topic, endovascular management of acute deep vein thrombosis. Let me tell you overview of the topic. Endovascular management of acute deep vein thrombosis, that is DVT, involves minimally invasive utilizing a specialized tool to remove or dissolve blood clots in affected veins. Catheters, directed thrombolysis, and mechanical thrombotomy are standard procedure to receive blood flow and ablate symptoms. To know more about this topic, I would like to invite sir and hand over this session to sir. Over to you, sir. Kindly proceed from here. Hi. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Yes, sir. You can share. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are clearly audible. You can proceed. Okay. Just give me two minutes. I'll just set it up. Yeah. Are the slides seen? Yes, sir. It is visible on full screen. You can continue. Okay, great. So I'll be talking about the endovascular management of acute uh, deep vein thrombosis. Um, I'm Dr. Karan. I'm a consultant um, vascular and interventional radiologist from Bombay. Um, I'll be discussing this topic, which I think um, is something that we are not very used to. We're used to conservative management for um, DVT. Um, but with the latest hardware and technologies which are now available in the country, um, endovascular management in the form of either thrombectomy, thrombolysis, that's the need of the hour. Uh, am I audible? Should I continue? And the screen's also seen? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, and... okay. so I'll just continue. Yeah. Uh, so I have no dis disclosures. Um, we'll be covering the following topics in this webinar. One is what is the etiopathogenesis of deep vein thrombosis? What is the rationale for early treatment? Why do we go ahead with endovascular first approach when we come to DVT? What are the current trials and data for endovascular management? What are the endovascular treatment options that we have in hand? And what is our proposed treatment algorithm? How do we manage patients with acute extensive BVD when they come to us? And obviously, we'll conclude with some take-home points that, we need, that we'll uh, learn during the course. Uh, so when it comes to pathophysiology of DVT, we all know the workout triad. Now that involves venous stasis with vascular injury and hypercoagulability. Whenever you have a combination of these three things, that is going to result in DVT. Um, but along with this, then you require some risk factors. So genetic factors like uh, deficiency of antithrombin, protein C, protein S deficiency, or acquired risk factors. Um, uh, patients uh, with increasing age, um, patients with an oncology, oncological malignancy, uh, patients in the post-op period or with prolonged immobility, uh, for example, patients uh, who've had stroke or um, uh, patients bedridden in the post-op period, uh, patients with congestive heart failure, uh, previous history of DVT, um, pregnant patients and patients on ossicles. All these are risk factors uh, which can trigger DVT. And of course, you have something called as May Turner syndrome. Uh, this is a condition in which the left common iliac vein is compressed by, um, by the right uh, common iliac artery. And, um, and that, that causes a trigger for acute DVT. Um, so you have just enlisted a few causes. So you have internal causes like atresia or, um, you know, uh, venous uh, stenosis or patients with a prior pacemaker or private, uh, prior stent. And external causes, like say you have a lymphocele, post-op patients, uh, patients with tumor, pregnancy, and iatrogenic causes. And of, of course, May Turner syndrome, where you have a, a congenital compression of the left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery. These are some of the risk factors. Uh, now, why is there a rationale for early DVT treatment? Uh, we are all used to conservative medical management where we just keep these patients on anticoagulation. Um, but with the latest trial and data, 
what is known is that um, early treatment in the form of endovascular first approach where we actually remove the entire thrombus um, has certain benefits. So certain conditions where endovascular first approach is what is edematous painful limb um, uh, or when you have phlegmasia cellular do, uh, uh, dolence uh, in which case you have associated cyanosis um, in these cases uh, these are two absolute indications because these are the results which can cause extreme venous congestion and that can lead to limb threatening venous gangrene uh, so when you have these two conditions um, going aggressively with a thrombectomy or a thrombolysis is what is now recommended um, along with this um, uh, the problem with DVT is that over a longer period of time, it is going to cause damage to the valves of the deep veins, and that is going to reduce the blood flow, and that is going to cause something called as chronic venous ischemia. Um, and the most feared long-term complication of DVT is a post-thrombotic syndrome, or PTS. Um, now, because of chronic venous hypertension, these patients, over the long period of time, they are prone to um, edema, uh, blackening, uh, recurrent venous ulcers, heaviness in that leg, um, these are all the signs of post-thrombotic syndrome, syndrome and ultimately they have a poor effect on the quality of life. So because of these factors, um, the recent data is to go aggressively with an endovascular first approach. Uh, so here we just have um, uh, some uh, classical um, uh, symptoms of patients with post-thrombotic lymphomas. So they'll either have recurrent leg swellings, recurrent pains, recurrent ulcerations. And these are some um, uh, photos of patients with long-standing uh, DVT. When they were not treated with uh, thrombectomy or thrombolysis, uh, that leg is always going to be more uh, swollen. Um, that leg is uh, bound to have a lot of distal pigmentation, uh, lipodermatosclerosis, uh, changes of chronic venous ischemia, and development of collaterals. Uh, so they may have um, umbilical collaterals, um, uh, abdominal skin wall collaterals, uh, because now the body is going to have uh, mechanisms to take the blood back to the heart. Um, so we have current data when it comes to endovascular treatment. We have current data. You have four RCTs which are available and one meta-analysis comparing endovascular approach um, with conventional uh, conservative medical management. And one of the, one of the biggest trials is the ATRAC trial which is the acute venous thrombosis, that is the removed thrombus removal with adjunctive CDT, that is catheter-directed thrombolysis. Um, the results came out in 2017, and uh, this was an NIH-funded uh, multi-center trial. Um, it involved 56 centers with 692 patients, and they evaluated the patients on uh, the Vitala, the Vitalata score as well as the quality of life and the pain score. Uh, however, this was a negative trial they found that the reduction of post-thrombotic syndrome within two years, um, the, it was only a 47% reduction in the uh, conservative group versus 48% in the ones which were aggressively handled. So it was a negative trial, but there were lots of pitfalls when it came to this trial. More importantly, they included patients with a high BMI. Um, they did not segregate patients who had iliofemoral DVT versus a lower distal DVT involving only the popliteal and the tibial veins. And they had a low stent rate. Um, they did not stent a lot of patients, which was, um, but they only did a plasty uh, at a higher rate. So that was a negative bias. And they did not have any dedicated venous stents placed, nor were there any um, heterogen, nor was there any homogeneity in terms of the kind of treatment they did. So because of that, there was something called as the ATRAC subgroup analysis, and they divided the patients into two types. One is that they evaluated the data when it came to proximal iliofemoral DVT, that is only those involving the iliacs and the femorals, and those involving the lower veins, that is the popliteal femoral and the tibial veins. And here they found a huge difference. So what they found was that when you're treating patients uh, with femoropopliteal DVT, uh, the results when it came to catheter-directed thrombolysis or when it came to um, conservative management, there was no significant difference. But when it came to iliofemoral DVT or proximal DVT, um, they found that yes, um, um, when, you when, when, when you went ahead with um, uh, percutaneous catheter-directed thrombolysis, there was a significant reduction in the proportion of patients who developed moderate as well as severe post-thrombotic syndrome, and there was a definite improvement in the quality of life. So these were the two conclusions of the subgroup analysis of the ATRAC trial. We had other trials as well. We had the CAVA trial. Um, and they found a moderate beneficial effect with, with adding ultrasound-guided uh, lysis uh, for DVT. 
we had the cavan trial and i'm not going to go into details of these trials but they also found that there was a persistent and increased clinical benefit uh, during a five year follow up and so they also suggested that yes adding additional cdt did improve a patients um uh, with uh, long term uh, development of severe pts but this was again for extensive proximal dvt and lastly we had the torpedo trial and in that as well they found that in patients with um, proximal dvt endovascular interventions is superior to anticoagulation in the reduction of recurrent thrombosis as well as in the development of post thrombotic syndrome so the overall conclusion of these trials is that yes for proximal ileo femoral extensive dvt early thrombus removal techniques are more effective than anticoagulation alone um the only downside is that of course there is a mild increased risk of bleeding uh, but with the right patient selection criteria you can definitely offer better um, long term results when it comes to pts as well as quality of life uh, so i'll just go ahead with what are the traditional treatment options for dvt now traditionally we are used to just giving conservative medical management and that is in the form of anticoagulation so unfractionated heparin as well as low molecular weight heparin and obviously now with the noax and the direct oral anticoagulation that is what is now routinely followed uh, systemic thrombolysis is not given because um, that has a increased risk of major bleeding so whenever you do thrombolysis which is more direct that is direct um, a uh, thrombolytic at the target site which is catheter directed thrombolysis um with image guidance that will obviously reduce the dose of thrombolytics that you're going to use um so what are the endovascular treatment options we have a couple of options um the first is obviously local thrombolysis that we just do a catheter directed thrombolysis the second is that we remove this thrombus by fragmentation so either we can do a balloon guided uh, angioplasty we can use certain catheters for aspiration or we can use dormia baskets etc to just um, macerate the entire thrombus and then remove it um, and then we also have uh, two others one is mechanical thrombectomy where we are not using any form of thrombolysis it's just a device to actually suck out the entire thrombus for example asprex or the indigo system and pharmaco mechanical thrombectomy so in this we're using a combination of both lysis as well as thrombectomy and uh, the device that we are using in the indian setup most commonly is angiojet by boston scientific so i'll just uh, roughly just go through these uh, briefly so with mechanical thrombectomy we just place either a rotational pigtail catheter or a large sheath um, or a large sheath um, uh, catheter and then we actually just suck out the entire thrombus Uh, so this is something you just lyse it, give a little bit of thrombolysis, and actually manually suck it out. But um, the the success rate of this is not that much as compared to mechanical and pharmaco mechanical thrombectomy. It will be the range of fifty to sixty percent uh, compared to an eighty to ninety percent reduction in uh, thrombus burden with the other methods. Uh, so then we have pharmaco mechanical thrombectomy. Now uh, the device that we are using is AngioJet. Now this is a special device. It's a special catheter. it has two modes one is the mode which is called as the lysis mode where pulsed um a uh, pulsed um at 5 mm 5 mm um, uh, pulses of tpa or alteplase are given through the side holes of the catheter and this is given directly where the thrombus is present and uh, following this we generally wait for around 30 to 40 minutes odd for the tpa to act and then with a special rheolytic thrombectomy uh, mechanical mechanism of the catheter we actually suck out the entire thrombus uh, so it's literally a catheter going into the thrombus like seen here and uh, first with the lysis mode we give tpa and then uh, with a large uh, with the with the rheolytic or the thrombectomy mode the entire uh, the entire thrombus is actually sucked out Uh, so i'll just go through our management algorithm that we use um now obviously with dvt it's a multidisciplinary approach we require a good um, anesthesia backup we obviously require a good critical care and an icu team to uh, manage the pre and the post op and a good nephrologist in the picture because post thrombectomy or thrombolysis um there is a little bit of uh, hemoglobin urea so the creat and the renal function tests are bound to rise up a little so that requires a little bit of hydration as well as a little bit of uh, management from the nephro side uh, for a good uh, 48 to 72 hours post procedure and the procedure can be tailored depending on the patient needs depending on the thrombus burden and obviously depending on the finances and the cost because some of these uh, procedures are expensive some of these catheters are expensive so we have a four step approach we first do a good pre intervention examination uh what we do in this is that we have a questionnaire to uh, see the amount of edema see the quality of life and the vitellata scores and then we do a diagnostic test obviously a color doppler or um 
um, a CT angio or an MR angio is required. Uh, getting the age of the thrombus, these um, these procedures are generally recommended when the when they come in the acute stage. So that is in the first fourteen days. And um, we also want to document what is the exact extent of the thrombus. So whether it's involving the popliteals, the tribules, and whether it has extension up to the IVC or it's only up to the common iliac and the external iliac. Uh, so cross-sectional imaging may be required in these stages, especially when you have slightly older patients in their 50s and 60s. Uh, we advise this also to just rule out an underlying mass lesion. So either a CT or an MR venography uh, may be uh, performed to assess the proximal iliac and the caval extent, as well as to rule out any underlying mass lesion. Uh, a routine echo is generally done uh, to look for any RA and RV uh, dilatation to rule out pulmonary embolism, which is already there. And if that is suspected, we may go ahead with a CT pulmonary angio as well. So in our pre-intervention examination, um, what we do is we examine the patient factors. Uh, so we obviously want to look at whether the patient has any pregnancy status, any underlying tumor, malignancy, bleeding, coagulation, recent surgery, because all these are contraindications to lysis because they have a high risk of bleeding. Um, getting the etiology of the thrombus is important. Uh, so you want to rule out whether there's any there's been any past history of uh, recurrent thrombosis either in the legs or at other sites, which would suggest probably a genetic uh, coagulation disorder. Um, you want to rule out extrinsic compression either by tumor either by tumor or you want to rule out Turner syndrome like we discussed, and these factors may be responsible for recurrent DVT. Um, the point with this is that if you have a suspicion of recurrent DVT, they may require long-term coagulation and they may require um, a, a proper hematological workup uh, to look for these genetic causes. More importantly, uh, if it's MTS, for example, Mayturner syndrome, or if there's an underlying obstruction, they may require venoplasty and stenting as well, probably in the same sitting. Uh, the next is that you want to select the ideal patient. Um, so uh, the results of thrombectomy and thrombolysis would be more when you have the ideal patient. Uh, so in our purview, the ideal patient would probably be a patient with a younger age because you would be more aggressive rather than going for a conservative endovas uh, rather than going for a conservative medical management. So ideal patients uh, under 60, 65, uh, they would be ideal. You're, the, the more you go 70, 80, the chances of bleeding increase. So we generally go towards the conservative side in such patients. Um, more importantly, they should not have other comorbidities like other bleeding tendencies. Generally, we would avoid these uh, procedures if there's an underlying malignancy or tumor, which is probably the cause for the compression um, and obviously thrombus characteristics. So these procedures are advocated only for massive and submassive extensive lower limb DVT, like we saw in the ATRAC trial, as well as the other trials. And ideally, it is only for iliofemoral DVT. Uh, we generally don't advise this for isolated femoral and isolated femoral or popliteal or tibial DVT, uh, because the trials, like they've already said, that uh, conservative versus uh, aggressive endovascular management, the results are more or less the same. So for extensive iliofemoral DVT, which has an acute presentation that is within the within 14 days is what we advise. And obviously patients with limb threatening DVT, that is those going into venous gangrene, those would be the, those would be the cases where we would be very aggressive with respect to our management. And obviously the cost factor plays a role because some of these procedures are expensive. Uh, when it comes to endovascular treatment, uh, these procedures are done under local anesthesia with uh, mild sedation only. Um, um, IVC filter placement is something that we routinely do. So we either may be using the jugular route or we may be using uh, the contralateral femoral route for placing an IVC in the infrarenal location. Uh, this is a retrievable IVC filter. So we generally remove it in the next three to four weeks uh, after the procedure. Uh, the purpose of placing the IVC filter, again, the data is very variable, uh, whether the filter placement has any actual role or not. Uh, but from our experience, we feel that because there's so much of maneuvering with respect to CDD as well as with respect to thrombectomy and thrombolysis, there is a chance of a small pulmonary emboli um, uh, getting dis uh, small emboli getting dislodged into the pulmonary circulation uh, during the procedure. So we routinely advise for a retrievable IVC filter which we place, although the data is not very strong for this. And um, venous access, so we may either be using the distal femoral vein or the popliteal vein for access. And uh, these accesses are placed under USG guidance. And we routinely, we advise um, for our patients, we are generally comfortable with pharmacomechanical thrombectomy. Uh, we are comfortable using the angiojet uh, device by Boston Scientific. And this is for acute clot removal. Uh, a lot of these patients have underlying chronic lesions. 
so they may present acutely uh, but they may have an underlying chronic occlusion and this is probably an acute on chronic presentation they may have an underlying narrowing either secondary to methana syndrome also routinely a balloon angioplasty that's a venoplasty with a 14 or a 16 mm balloon is done and a dedicated venous stent can be placed to establish the outflow i have a few cases uh, which i'll be sharing um now the use of venous stents is again debatable a lot of patients um uh, we do place it in the acute setting otherwise we may keep them on a follow up and then place them at a later date of 3 to 4 weeks when they come for the filter removal as well uh, the purpose of placing a stent is that because they have an underlying chronic lesion they are highly prone to recurrent uh, thrombo uh, recurrent thrombosis and uh, by establishing an outflow especially in methana um uh, those chances of recurrent uh, thrombosis reduce substantially uh, when it comes to post procedure follow up we keep them on anticoagulation now this anticoagulation are a uh, uh, drug of choice is generally clexane we keep them on clexane uh, while they are in the inpatient or in the icu for the first 48 to 672 hours and then we shift them to um uh, direct oral anticoagulations either rivaroxaban or aliquis apixaban and um a long term anticoagulation should be considered when you have unprovoked dvt those with a genetic predisposition otherwise generally anticoagulation for 6 to 8 months um and class 2 compression stockings is what we advise for all our patients in the post procedure period so i'll just share a few cases now this was a 30 year old female acute iliofemoral dvt uh, as you can see uh, that there is ecogenic um, the entire vein is completely uh, filled with an ecogenic thrombus and uh, we have three images one is the first is the pre procedure venogram and as you can see there is no um, uh, uh, i don't know if my arrow is visible but there is no um, uh, contrast which is present uh, there is no contrast um, uh, going up to the iliacs and up to the ivc and there are multiple collaterals which have formed uh, so you cross these lesions with a catheter you generally keep them on either a cdt that is um, catheter directed thrombolysis or you can uh, put them with pharmacomechanical thrombectomy uh, we've done a cdt in this case and this was the final image post cdt that is post lysis for uh, 12 hours there's good opening up of the vein and then we also did a manual uh, suction aspiration of uh, the clot in these cases and that was the final result uh, so what happens with um, uh, this is an image that in which we've used pharmacomechanical thrombectomy and um, this is the angiogenic cat uh, this is post the angiogenic catheter and what you have collected in the back that's the entire clot um another case that we had and um again um ileal uh, acute extensive uh, ileal dvt uh, there was an underlying lesion in this uh, like we were saying so we did a balloon plasty as you can see in the second image that's a balloon that we've dilated the entire vein and following that we've placed a stent and that is to establish a good outflow so we now have dedicated venous stents uh, with good radial strength for long term uh, patency of these stents uh when we are placing these stents an important finding is that we always place these stents uh, uh, these stents under uh, intravascular ultrasound that is under ivis guidance um so this was one of the cases that we did as you can see um uh, it's a catheter which is placed inside the vein and we get an ultrasound from uh, to map uh, to map the entire vein from inside so there is good 80% extrinsic compression and that was confirmed um, as methana syndrome on ivis and uh, then we placed a stent the purpose of ivis is that it not only helps us to establish a diagnosis uh, two other advantages one that it helps in proper sizing you can actually get the size of the actual size of the vein uh, both before and after the narrowing for uh, proper sizing and it also gives us a good uh, distal landing zone um, in the ivc um, so that it does not impinge on the contralateral side so this was the ivis image post stenting and as you can see the stent has opened up well uh so to summarize um management of acute deep vein thrombosis has come a long way um we no longer um are restricted to only conservative medical management uh, we have various devices various new techniques good endovascular treatment options now available good hardware where for acute extensive dvt we can offer our patients a thrombectomy or thrombolysis um ir as irs we play a key role in acute dvt management now not only from diagnosis but also in complete end to end care um the purpose of thrombectomy or thrombolysis is that you want to reduce the thrombus burden you want to establish the venous outflow um and that is the key uh, component in reducing long term uh, complications of dvt which include chronic venous insufficiency venous hypertension as well as post thrombotic syndrome 
The best results of endovascular first approach are obviously when you select the ideal patients. And uh, in India, unfortunately, cost factor plays a major deterrent to endovascular treatment. Um, for getting up the ideal patient, we would say that a young patient um, who has a low risk of bleeding without any comorbidities or with significant fewer comorbidities and who has an acute presentation, that is uh, within the first 14 days, and also with extensive iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis, these are the patients who would get maximum benefit. Um, the basic principle of any endovascular treatment is to restore the flow early. You want to reduce um, the tumor, uh, the thrombus burden, and you want to restore uh, the vein patency fast and effectively, not only the inflow, but also the outflow. For, for improving the outflow, sometimes venous stents may be required. And the chosen method, that is whether you go ahead with a CDT or whether you go ahead only with suction thrombectomy or with pharmacomechanical or mechanical thrombectomy depends on multiple factors. Obviously cost, uh, you want to look at factors, risk factors of bleeding where thrombolysis may not be possible and you may have to only do a mechanical thrombectomy. And of course, uh, depending on local requirements, depending on hospital protocols, um, those things may change. These are my numbers and um, any questions and I'm ready to take them. Thank you so much, sir, for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us and making this session informative one, sir. I definitely think this session knowledge is going to help all the participants who have joined this session. As I can see, sir, we have received some questions. If you allow yeah, sure. your permission, shall we take? Yeah, of course. The of question course, is yeah. from Dr. Agarwal. He is asking, okay. what is the pathophysiology of superior vena cava, that is SVC syndrome, in the deep venous thrombolysis? Yeah, uh, so SVC syndrome is um, the most common causes of SVC syndrome. You would generally see them in, uh, in patients with cancer. So especially when they have large mediastinal masses, say a lymphoma or an anterior or a middle mediastinal mass compressing the superior vena cava. In our practice, that's the most common cause. Uh, the second common cause is uh, patients with long-dwelling catheters. So especially nephrology patients in, in whom you've placed um, a long-standing indwelling catheter, either a hemodialysis catheter or a tunneled perm cat. Um, these are the patients in which your SVC gets occluded. So chronic, uh, so they would get developed collaterals or they may present with acute thrombosis because of an underlying SVC lesions. Onco patients, I think those are um, the most common causes for SVC syndrome or indwelling catheters, two, two major causes. Uh, thank you so much sir, for answering it, sir. I hope that Dr. Agarwal has received his answer. Another question I can see from Dr. Sneha, she is asking, how can we define virtual traits? Uh, so virtual trides is uh, more of a path. It's a more of a pathological diagnosis um, for any thrombosis to develop, whether it's arterial or venous, you require these three factors. That is obviously uh, the endothelial should be injured. Uh, there should be some amount of stasis of blood and um, uh, there should be some sort of hypercoagulability. So it's a pathological diagnosis and that's the any thrombosis, whether it's arterial or venous, it's not something that it's, it's more of, um, um, practical or, um, it, rather than practical, it's more of a theoretical uh, basis for DBT. Thank you so much sir, for explaining yeah. it, sir. I hope that Dr. Sneha has received his answer. I yeah. can see another question from Dr. Shubhanshu Singh. He is asking, what is the role of hemodynamic venous insufficiency in the pathogenesis of DVD? DVT, uh, sorry. Uh, so DVT per se does not have any, um, so it's more of venous. So it's more like that DVT would cause venous insufficiency. Whenever you have deep vein thrombosis, what happens is that the underlying, uh, the veins have valves. Uh, so because of thrombosis, those valves get damaged. Um, whenever valves are going to get damaged over a long period of time, when you look at the data for two years, three years, four years, because the damage, there is damage of the valves, blood is not going to go back towards the heart um, in a significant way. And for that reason, there is always going to be some sort of venous, that is what is called as venous insufficiency. That is uh, because blood is not getting um, uh, uh, there's no proper outflow of blood back to the heart. There is always going to be some sort of venous pooling or blood pooling in that leg. And that is called as venous insufficiency. So it's more like DVT causes venous insufficiency and venous hypertension. Okay, thank you so much, sir. We will yeah. be taking last question for today's yeah. session, which is from Dr. Subramanyam. He is yeah. asking how do extensive and intensive coagulation system operate in the pathogenesis of DVT? 
so uh, obviously the entire pathophysiology of any thrombosis you're going to have two pathways one is the extrinsic coagulation pathway and one is the intrinsic coagulation pathway uh, that i think if that's the question that uh, that is being asked when it comes to extrinsic and intrinsic risk factors for dvt i think if if that is what he's asking for then i think when it comes to intrinsic risk factors it means that patient has uh, genetic risk factors like uh, certain coagulation disorders like protein c and protein s deficiency and when you talk about extrinsic risk factors it means um, a certain added factors from the environment for example uh, dehydration or extensive immobility or in the immediate post operative period or lower limb fractures those are the extrinsic uh, factors so when it come i think um, if that's the question then i think that's the difference between the two okay thank you so yeah. much sir and yeah. i can see the on feedback from dr sneha she has written thank you yeah. so much for answering the question wonderful okay. session thank you thank you so much okay thank sir uh, as i can see sir there is no more question sir with all your permission shall we conclude this session yes 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 thank you okay sir thank you so much sir and thanks thank for you. your sparing your precious time here and hope thank to you so see much. you again with different topic in coming time yeah, sir sure. and till sure. then take care